Thank you. Well, what a delight it's been to be here at this conference and uh, to see this enthusiasm for the Reformation. Right after this, uh, shortly after it, I do have to catch a plane. My wife and I live close to O'Hare Field in Chicago. The planes come right over our uh, condo. In fact, one day I was just walking from the dining room to the bedroom and a flight attendant told me to sit down. <laughs> I'm sure you realize that the Chicago Cubs uh, are having a little bit of difficulty. They've done very well last year. We used to be able to buy a Cub t-shirt in Chicago that says, anyone can have a bad century. <laughs> and uh, I remember one year when their pitching machine pitched a no-hitter. <laughs> Let me give you a prayer request in advance. Uh, Rebecca and I are going to be, I'm going to be in Chicago speaking at Moody Church on the 29th of October, which is Reformation Sunday. And in the morning, I'm going to be giving essentially the message I gave here Sunday morning. But in the evening, I'll be talking about rescuing the gospel in America. Five false gospels coming into the evangelical church. Maybe you can join us for that weekend in Chicago. But if you can't, it's going to be streamed. And it's the service is at 5, so here it will be at 6, and uh, you'll be able to get in on that. Now, we have a very serious topic to cover. And, and by the way, oh yeah, I didn't tell you, that night, that Sunday night, the 29th, God willing, Rebecca and I get on a plane, and we fly to Germany, and we arrive in the afternoon on Monday. Hopefully, I have a good sleep that night. And the next day, which is actually Reformation Sunday, when all of Germany, because it's the 500th anniversary, is having a holiday, it is a national holiday, I'm going to be speaking at a rally three times. The first time on what Martin Luther would say to the church today, the second to Christian workers. I'm going to be talking about their calling. And then in the evening, I'm speaking on the topic, a new Reformation for Germany. So pray for me as these messages are going to be coming together, God willing, in the next couple of days. And pray for stamina. You know, we are getting a little old. I said to Rebecca the other day, I said, honey, I don't look 76, do I? And she said, no, no, you don't. But you used to. <laughs> so Now, before we get to a very serious topic, I want just a moment of levity. How many of you are Baptists? Could I see your hands, please? Almost have to spray for them. <laughs> One day I was walking across the San Francisco Bridge and I noticed that there was a guy who was about to jump. So I asked, I asked to detain him because I wanted to put some film in my camera. I said to him, God loves you. He said, nobody loves you, loves me. And I said, no, God does. And he said, I guess you're right. And a tear came to his eye. I said, are you a Christian, a Jew, or a Hindu, or what? He said, a Christian. Small world, me too, Protestant, Catholic, or Greek Orthodox. He said, Protestant. I said, me too, what franchise? He said, Baptist. He said, me too, Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist, I asked. He said, Northern Baptist. I said, me too, Northern Conservative Baptist or Northern Liberal Baptist? He said, Northern Conservative Baptist. I said, me too, Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist or Northern Conservative Reform Baptist? He said, Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist. I said, me too, Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist, Great Lakes Region or Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist, Eastern Region? He said, Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist, Great Lakes Region. I said, me too, Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist, Great Lakes Region, Council of 1879, or Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist, Great Lakes Region, Council of 1912. He said, Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist, Great Lakes Region, Council of 1912. And I screamed, die, heretic, and I pushed him over. <laughs> All right, take a deep breath. I have lots to say. As I frequently say, my responsibility is to speak, yours is to listen, and I pray that we shall end at the same time. I'm speaking today on the topic of Islam, interfaith dialogue, and Martin Luther. 
and we've got lots to cover. Wish that I had about two hours seminar. But we're going to hit all the high points so you won't miss anything. In 2004, the FBI uncovered the Brotherhood Plan for America. You should be acquainted with that. As a matter of fact, what it said is that we want a civilizational jihad by which the Western house will be destroyed by its own hands and by our hands. We're going to help them destroy themselves. Maybe the best way I can put this in context is to say that I saw a sign in a demonstration, a Muslim demonstration in Detroit that said, we will use the freedoms of the Constitution to destroy the Constitution. I can't go into detail as to all that that involves. I'm going to speak only about one sliver. And one of the things that the Muslims do is uh, Saudi Arabia pours millions of dollars into America for our leading universities to have what is known as interfaith studies. And they're always headed by a Muslim who introduces American students to Islam, a version that is palatable to Americans. And in this way, Islam is determined to change its image and to change what Islam really is. Now, I knew that that was going on in the universities, but what's happening in churches sometimes even is what is known as interfaith dialogue. Let me explain that to you. You have a Muslim who comes and who is given time to explain Islam. The Christian has equal time to, to uh, illustrate and to explain Christianity. But there's no cross-examination. And what's very important is each is allowed to say whatever he wants to say without being uh, criticized or, what shall I say, evaluated. They, they're just allowed to do whatever they want. That's true of the Muslim. It's also true of the Christian. Now, what is the goal of this interfaith dialogue? Well, let me quote the words of Sayyib Qutb. I hope I didn't mispronounce his name too badly. The goal of interfaith dialogue, he says, the chasm between Islam and unbelievers is great, and the bridge is not to be built across so that people on the two sides may mix with each other but only so that the people of the unbelievers may come over to Islam. Now, this summer I read a book entitled Interfaith Dialogue, A Guide for Muslims. It is a book that is written by Muslims for Muslims on how to do interfaith dialogue. Now, much of the book we agree with. It talks about uh, being tolerant, dressing well, smiling. Uh, it speaks about fairness and... Uh, reasonableness and all that, and we would certainly agree with that. But the rest of the book is to help Muslims to interpret Islam in such a way that it will be acceptable to American audiences. Now, I want you to pretend that you are a Christian in Saudi Arabia, Egypt, or some other Muslim nation like Syria, and you are listening to this, and you know that there has been Newsweek called a river of blood throughout the Middle East in recent years and in past years as Muslims have killed Christians. They've always advanced with the sword. You know what's going on. But this is what you hear. This is taken now from the book on how Muslims are to do interfaith dialogue. Islam should be presented as protecting and enhancing civil rights. That's page 42. Muslim participants can emphasize that Islam stands for the protecting rights of both men and women. That's also page 42. Many people in the West believe that Islam is a religion of re revenge, but they do not know that at its core are teachings of forgiveness and mercy. That's page 45. Muslims should avoid saying that Jews, Christians, and others will end up in hell. Such conversation should be avoided and then gives you an example as to how to avoid it. And um, it goes on, and, and I won't list everything that it is said here, but here, peaceful living and coexistence are at the very center of what Islam enjoins on all Muslims. Well, yes, among Muslims, but not among apostates, but... And then I'll just give you one more, because we, we have a real time crunch here. Muhammad's goal was to develop an interfaith federation 
so that Jews, Christians, Muslims, and pagans would live together in peace, he used the goals of forgiveness and mercy to reconcile differences between individuals. Do you know anything about Islam? Do you know anything about Muhammad? So here's what Muslims want. And here I'm going to introduce now Martin Luther. In fact, let me introduce Martin Luther, and then I want to say a word, and we'll get into Luther uh, very quickly here. Martin Luther believed that every German should read the Quran. He was upset about the fact that it was not translated earlier. He wrote a preface to the, to the German edition and also to the Latin edition. Because Martin Luther believed that no one would ever apostatize to Islam if they read the Quran. They would see what kind of a book it was, and then he describes it in some unflattering terms. Now, the simple fact is Luther believed that Muslims do not want us to read the Quran. You know, you often hear, well, it's in Arabic, and Arabic is this heavenly language that can't be really translated and so forth. They do not want us to read the Quran because they do not want us to know what the Quran says. So now let's talk about interfaith dialogue once again before we plunge into Luther. What happens is Muslims, it is true, do not want us to read the Quran or the Hadith, what they want us to do is to listen to them and they will tell us what Islam believes. And in the process, they give a version of Islam that, is, that does not exist. In one case on TV, on uh, YouTube rather, in a church there was an interfaith dialogue where the Muslim went on giving one misconception of Islam after another and then said, you know, in the end Christians are going to join with Muslims to fight against Antichrist and so forth. And you read this and it's dizzy and, and he's not corrected because remember the rules of interfaith dialogue. You say your piece, the Christian said his piece, giving a defense of the Trinity and so forth, but all of this misconception is there. The other thing that the Muslims know is that when they are talking to an American audience, they can be absolutely sure that 95% of the people have never even seen a Quran, much less having read one. They also know that Americans are just longing to hear that Islam is a religion of peace. They're longing for those words that there is no compulsion in religion. Please tell us that. And they say, well, there's no compulsion in religion. That's what the Quran says. A very quick parenthesis here. Brothers and sisters, if there is no compulsion in religion, why do the actual laws of Saudi Arabia, where Islam began, why do the actual laws say that whoever converts from Islam to another religion must be put to death? It's the death penalty. I thought that there's no compulsion in religion. So basically, if I may be clearer than I need to be, let me say that Muslims know that if they come into a church, they are talking to a population of people generally that are very naive, very gullible, and they can give a version of Islam that is really a misconception. Now, Martin Luther. Luther lived at a time when the Ottoman Empire was beginning. In 1529, the Muslims were circling around the city of Vienna, and that's why Charles didn't kill him. If you were here Sunday morning, you remember I told you that. Charles didn't kill him because he needed the support of the German, Germans in his war against the Turks. And then they came back again years later, but the, um, the Habsburg Empire was able to repel them. Oh, how important. Do you realize that if the Habsburg Empire had collapsed, instead of uh, cathedrals throughout Europe, it would all be mosques? And that happened again in 722, much earlier. And that, of course, was at the Battle of Pointers. Fascinating stuff. All of your future as Europeans hinged upon the victory of that battle. But we must hurry. So there were theologians in Luther's time, and Luther is writing now because Hungary had collapsed, most of Romania was now under the, uh, the Ottomans, the, uh, the armies were moving, and Luther thought that Germany would be next. 
So his, his writing about the Turks was not an academic exercise. It was not just something that, oh, this is interesting. He was concerned about pastoral issues, namely his congregation, what would happen. So he read extensively. He read and studied the Quran. And now what I, oh, because there was a, a theologian, for example, like Nicholas von Kruss, who said, um, you know, Islam has truth too. They believe in one God just like we do. We should have a heavenly synod. We ought to get together, find areas of commonality, and if we do that, we'll be able to live together in peace, and we will discover all of these areas in which we have similarities. That was the agenda that, uh, that some of the theologians were advocating. Luther did not fall for such legends. So with that intro, I'm going to tell you what Luther believed, give you a summary of it, and then we'll make our own summary and talk about the opportunities that God has given us here in America through immigration even, and we'll talk about that, and uh, I'll be on my way. First of all, Luther believed that Islam was the work of Satan. And what I want to do is to give you his three reasons for why he had such a strong opinion. And um, many of you perhaps don't take notes, and that's perfectly acceptable. Those of you who do, look at these. I have a number of people also on the front row. Did you know that front row on earth is front row in heaven? <laughs> and that's why I always keep my eye on the people in the back row, because... Three reasons, let me give them to you. First of all, because Islam attacks heavenly rule. It attacks Jesus Christ. Now, if you know anything about Islam, you know that the Quran, I think Jesus is mentioned uh, 93 times, if I remember correctly, it says many nice things about Jesus. It talks about the miracles that Jesus did, and every Muslim that knows anything about Islam will tell you that they honor Jesus. But Luther looked at this, and he saw that indeed, instead of honoring Jesus, they were really seriously demeaning him. It says, and by the way, I'm reading today, much of what I'm going to share with you is from a paper that is written by a friend of mine, and titled, um, the author is Stefan Fair. Now, I need to tell you that I read Luther's book on the Turks, but uh, this man has kind of codified it and chosen some choice quotes, which I am using today. Luther knew that the Quran praised Christ very much, but reduced him to an ordinary prophet, denied that he was the son of the living God, and denied that he was the savior of the world, and denied even that Jesus was crucified. You know that that's true. In Surah 4, 157, it says regarding Jesus, they crucified him not. They thought they crucified him. So at the very heart of the gospel, the crucifixion of Christ, it is denied in Islam. Jesus is not the Son of God. Jesus did not die. There was no resurrection. Supposedly, Christ took him directly to heaven, but there is no cross. There is no salvation. So Luther looked at that and said that this, of course, is a direct attack about Jesus Christ. And uh, he says that the Muslim, of course, denies that Jesus Christ is the only Son of God, conceived of the Holy Spirit, born uh, of the Virgin Mary, and so forth. He says, um, I'm quoting now, from this, each one can see that Muhammad is a destroyer of our Lord and his kingdom. Since he who denies the parts of Christ, if you deny that he is the Son of God, died for us, and you deny that he lives and reigns at the right hand of God, what does he have more than Christ? There is gone, he says, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, baptism, sacrament, all that is wiped out. And of course, Muhammad is exalted way above Jesus Christ in the Quran and in Muslim teaching. I had somebody who teaches about Islam, and he says, it is, it is less likely that you be stoned for criticizing Allah than if you criticize Muhammad. 
Muhammad is a prophet who is greatly revered, way, way above Jesus. So Luther says they're attacking heavenly rule. Secondly, he says that they attack earthly rule. He says um, that the denial of Jesus brings a murderous spirit. Luther determined that according to the Quran, to use the sword was considered the noblest work. From the Quran, he understood that Muslims learned that they would render God a great service through robbery and murder. He understood their conceit, their desire to rule, and uh, the evil that they did. And Luther says they are nothing other than street thieves and true murderers. I have been in Istanbul, ancient Constantinople. And by the way, one of the reasons I wanted to be there is I wanted to go into the Church of Holy Wisdom, Hagia Sophia, because did you know that the architecture of Moody Church is inspired by the Church of Holy Wisdom in Istanbul. Moody Church, one of the most beautiful churches without any question in all of America. And I wanted to be there in that church. But we were there and we were where the sultans ruled because that was their capital after 1453, remember? And in all the displays in the museum, the one that attracted the most attention was the swords of Muhammad. Now, isn't it interesting that the symbol of Christianity is the cross and the symbol of Muhammad and Islam is the sword. They've always conquered with the sword. And you had an alternative. You could be put to death. You could convert to Muslim Islam. And if not, you could become a servant to the Muslims. And murder and mayhem and uh, ruling the sword. I think it was Muhammad who said that the sword represents the noblest work. So uh, Luther is not surprised at this. He says the unbridled violence in Islam is not surprising. He quotes the words of Jesus, John 8, 44, that the devil is a liar and a murderer. Luther said a lying spirit controlled Muhammad and Islam kills the soul with the lie and the body with murder. He says, and I'm quoting Luther directly, as the lie destroys the spiritual position of faith and truth, murder destroys all earthly order put in place by God. Because it is not possible to have praiseworthy earthly rule of order where murder and robbery are in practice. So uh, that was the second reason. All right, it attacks heavenly rule. He said it attacks earthly rule. And the third reason is because it attacks marriage. Luther read the Quran and saw what it had to say about women. He points out the fact that the Quran does not respect matrimony, that a man is allowed to marry several women, and also to easily get rid of them. Within this, he finds a blatant contradiction to the word of God. To him, this breakdown of a marriage is not only a regrettable violation of a human custom, but sin in its coarsest form. And as by this, God's holy law and commandment being unhinged. You know, or you should know, that in Surah chapter 4, verse 34, and also 38, 44, it says in the Quran that a man can beat his wife. Now, I haven't read the whole Quran, but I've, because I wrote a book on it that I may mention in a moment, I've read much of it. And uh, in, in my translation, where it says a man can beat a wife, there is a footnote that says he can beat her lightly. Well, that really helps a lot, I'm sure. But here's the point. At Moody Church, we have a man whose mother tongue is Arabic, and he says that the word is flog, just like you might flog a camel in the very same way that a man can flog his wife. So Luther looks at this and sees that wife beating is indeed allowed in Islam if your wife is disobedient. And he looks at this and says, now this is an attack against marriage. So we have three reasons. Number one, it attacks heavenly rule because of its view of Christ. Secondly, it attacks earthly rule because of its unbridled violence. And third, it attacks the family and destroys uh, matrimony and uh, because of what it says about women. Now, Luther believed that religious war is blasphemy. 
Oh, I have to throw this in. You know, he would have been opposed to the Crusades because the Crusades were fought under the banner of the cross, and Luther thought that was absolutely terrible. But if your magistrate, if the secular powers ask you to go to war against Islam, then you go. And by the way, that was the problem with the Crusades. The Crusades were perfectly legitimate. I mean, 40 monks had been killed in Bethlehem and so forth. So it was very legitimate that people uh, go rescue the Holy Land, so to speak, but it was done wrongly. Uh, you know, when the Pope asked all an army to come together, it was a ragtag of criminals and others, and, and they fought it under the banner of the cross. Luther said, no, that should have been fought under the banner of the secular powers, and then uh, you'd have had a standing army, etc. Now, there were Christians who argued in favor of one of these heavenly synods, we would say today, interfaith dialogue. They gave three reasons that I'll give to you very quickly. First of all, they said, oh, Islam is tolerant. You know, once they conquer you, you can believe whatever you will. <laughs> Luther knew better than that. He knew it from the Quran. He knew it from personal experience about the reports that he was receiving. And he knew that that simply was not true. And you know that that is not true. There is no tolerance of religion, except maybe in certain pockets if you become a servant to the Muslims. That is known as dimitude. So uh, Luther wouldn't buy that. Secondly, they said, well, there are some devout Muslims who do miracles. Luther looked at that and said, we should not be surprised because Satan himself does miracles. And so he, he said that... Um, that that didn't bother him at all. Luther says that to uncover such fake miracles is easy because they do not happen in the name of Christ, but against the name of Christ and in the name of Muhammad. So he says we know in advance that they are all fake miracles and they are done by Satan. Thank you very much. There was a third reason that some people thought Islam might be right or that uh, there should be cooperation with Islam. And the third reason was this. They said, look at the victories of Islam. Now I want to pause here and take a deep breath for just a moment. A number of years ago, uh, 2009, Rebecca and I were in Turkey. We were visiting the seven churches of Asia Minor, written about in the book of Revelation, and we discovered there are no churches, no visible churches, only mosques. Previously, I had been in Istanbul, and I was with a very devout Muslim guide, and we got along well. And we talked, and he said this very diplomatically, but he said, Islam's ability to replace the church, and we could say crush it, is proof of its superiority as a religion. So if you want to know whether or not Islam is superior, go to Egypt where there are 3,000 churches today, and um, they are all mosques. Is, you know, did you know that most of the Middle East was nominally Christian? I mean, we're talking about Syria and the other countries. And uh, Islam came and conquered them and, and won them all over. That's why it's important for us to know that we'd better not take our future for granted. Amen. But let's put that on the shelf for just a moment. So this troubled me because I thought to myself, if the superiority of religion is proven by its ability to conquer Christianity and Christian countries, it makes Jesus look weak. So I went back to the ship, we were on a cruise, and my heart was very heavy, and I said, Lord, give me wisdom as to what these non-existent churches, to whom Jesus took the time to actually write letters, give me wisdom as to what they say to the American church. And I think it was on the back of an envelope in about, I don't know, half an hour, hour, Seven or eight immediate lessons came to mind, and that was the small seed from which my book grew, which is entitled The Cross in the Shadow of the Crescent. Now, I know that earlier, at least a couple of days ago, there were still some in the bookstore, but The Cross in the Shadow of the Crescent, and of course, it's still in print and so forth, but here's the thing. I thought, among other things, think of Revelation 13, Antichrist rules. All who dwell upon the face of the earth shall worship him, except those whose names were written in the Lamb's book of life from before the foundation of the world, okay? All who dwell upon the face of the earth worship him. 
It gives you chills. If you take the point of view that a religion or a leader's ability to crush others and to force worship is proof of superiority, put your vote in with Antichrist because he rules the world and all worship him except the elect. Well, then chapter 15 of Revelation says this, And I beheld, and lo, it says there that I saw on a sea of glass mingled with fire, them who had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over the number of his name. Chapter 13, it says, He was given authority to overcome the saints and to kill them with the sword. That's chapter 13. Chapter 15, I beheld, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them who had gotten the victory over the, over the beast and over the number of his name. And they sing the songs of God saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, O Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? What a difference two chapters make. Amen. Chapter 13, Antichrist is victorious. Chapter 15, the saints whom he killed are triumphant in heaven. A couple of chapters later, Antichrist is in hell and burns forever and ever and is tormented. And the point to be made is this, that the superiority of religion in this life is not proven by who can kill the most people and who can rule over the most people. I was thinking there could be an amen there, but <laughs> I've learned in this part of the world to not expect that. <laughs> Sunday morning, I had a tough time here in the church. It is still legal. You know, the, a, the ACLU has not yet said no amens in church. Amen. amen. <laughs> All right. All right. Just want to make sure here. So the point to be made is Luther wouldn't buy it at all. There were those who said, well, look at the superiority of Islam. They are winning all the victories. He says, um, nevertheless, even though Muslims can be devout and uh, they can do miracles, the victorious march of Muslim Turks was another trial for Christians. Did not the great success of the Turks mean that God takes pleasure in the Muslims? Luther says that belief comes to another opinion if you believe the word of God. He says it is only about what God says in the scriptures. Neither the victory of the Turks nor the defeat of the Christians is the determining factor, but what God allows and prohibits, what God's word teaches and what it does not. Well, thank you. <laughs> you know what Luther is really saying is this. He says it in one passage. He said, if you look about and see no reason to believe that God is on your side because you're losing everything, what does the Christian do? The Christian believes God's bare word, Luther says. Amen. Amen. That is a little better. Now, what does Luther say that the pastors should do? He says, pastors and preachers must bear a great responsibility. You know, I think that I skipped something here. Too much to say, but I have to tell you this. He believed that Islam was the rod of God's discipline against a disobedient, unrepentant church. And he says here that the real problem is not the Muslims, the real problem is the church. I wanted to quote that because with being, without being too hard on Europe, our friends in Europe, I have to say, having been there a couple of times, if you say anything against Islam, you are vilified, you are intolerant, you are hateful, you are this, you are that, and so forth. And, um, and Luther says, of course, that the judgment of God is upon Europe, and he is using the Turk to bring Europe to repentance. And he saw it as a judgment. And I can't help but think that Europe, which has so self-consciously and directly rejected God that whether or not Islam is that judgment. And of course, we are not perhaps far behind. But that was Luther's view. He says here that it is a rod of God's judgment. Now, what should pastors do? Well, 
He says pastors bear a great responsibility. They should work tirelessly with seriousness to call the church to repentance and to remind them that because of our sins, we deserve this penalty. Luther said it is the task of the pastor to inform the church through sermons about the abominations of Muhammad, to strengthen people's faith so that the true church will not be swayed adversely. And he says, um, uh, you know, again, read the Quran so that people know what kind of a book it really is. In the last few minutes, I want to ask the question, what now, where do we go, and so forth. First of all, uh, what we do need to do is to repent. We do not understand the extent and the blindness, as uh, David Paul Tripp or Paul David Tripp explained to us. Our own blindness is huge. I hope to preach on this when I'm in Germany. I want to point out, you know what the biggest church problem with the church at Laodicea was? It wasn't that it was lukewarm and all those other things. It was that it was lukewarm and thought it was hot. That was the big problem because if it had seen its need, there's a good cure for that. It's called repentance. But if you don't see your need, there's really nothing to repent of. Second, regarding, second thing we should be doing is we should educate ourselves regarding the Quran. Now, instead of reading the Quran and going out and buying one, though you could do that, I suggest that you read books that have been written about the Quran, about those who have studied it carefully. Uh, books by Robert Spencer, for example. Robert Spencer has written about 10 books on various aspects of Islam. His books are very readable, and he will put Islam in context, and uh, it'll be a great read. For example, I think he has one entitled the... Uh, uh, there, there's one on the Quran. It is the politically incorrect view of, the Isl of Islam, it says. But Robert Spencer or Nabil Qureshi, who died recently, wrote a book entitled Seeking Allah and Finding Jesus. This is an excellent book also for Muslims because he goes through his whole, his whole struggle with going toward Christianity and finally having all of his objections answered. And he received Christ. And as you know, he worked with Rabbi Zacharias and so forth. And this young man just died a couple of weeks ago. So educate yourself. Educate your children. If you don't want to preach on this, pastors in your church, make books available for people to read. Hold seminars, etc., etc. And the third thing is faith. Neither fear nor anger. Neither fear nor anger should have any place in the life of a Christian. It is Eric Metaxas, I think, who says that anyone who has fear or anger um, uh, has, is not worshiping Jesus. And Luther's whole point was, okay, if we're going to die as martyrs, are we better than Jesus, Luther said? And you know, he expected to be put to death by the emperor, of course. And then it was whisked off and hidden in the Wartburg Castle. But the point is that Luther is saying it is so important for us to simply, calmly look at God's word, believe it, and so forth. Now, let me talk about what we can do in befriending Muslims. No matter what your view is of immigration, God has given us a great opportunity in America and Canada to befriend Muslims, they are out of their home country, they are somewhat more open, and furthermore, if they tell you that, uh, Quran is a, that Islam is a religion of peace, you don't have to argue with them because they may actually believe that. Most of them, I've discovered, have not read the Quran either because what I was talking about earlier was in a general assembly where there, are, where there is interfaith dialogue, but befriend them and um, every Muslim who comes to Christ will tell you they came to Christ because of the witness of a Christian. Now, I know a situation very well, but I'm going to not say where it is and so forth, because as you know, uh, these things could be found out, uh, where Christians have met together. They began with a group of about 12 Christians, and then it continued to grow. 
They met about twice a month to call on God on behalf of their Syrian Muslim community. And then they became friends. I mean, they bring these people groceries. They are in and out of one another's homes. They do things with the kids. And uh, they meet in these homes, and they discuss things. They befriend. And now God is beginning to work so mightily that they have a man who, was, um, who is, uh, speaks Arabic and speaks their language, whatever the language of uh, Syria is, and they uh, come and, and he's holding prayer meetings in their homes and praying in the name of Jesus, and they are saying, come back because we want to hear more about this. There was a class that was being held for these dear people, and a woman said, right in the classroom, I no longer want to be a Muslim. I want to be a Christian. And uh, I received an email about two days ago while I was here saying that their first convert has taken place. A woman accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, and this is the beginning of what they hope eventually will be a church because God is working so mightily. So the thing is, we should be befriending these people. And I know that there's a lot of controversy in America regarding immigration and all, and I'm writing a book entitled um, The Church in Babylon, which I hope will be finished next year, and it has already a chapter on the whole immigration question. What I try to do is to separate the role of the state from the role of the church. But you know, the role of the church is to love everybody and to introduce people to the gospel. When the man, on the way to Jericho, fell among thieves, as you're going from Jerusalem to Jericho, the Good Samaritan didn't say, now, what religion are you? Are you here legally? Uh, who are you? No, you, you see somebody to help, and you help them. And God, indeed, has brought many people to us from other cultures, from other religions, whom we have the privilege of introducing to Jesus Christ. I don't have a lot of contact with Muslims, but in Chicago, almost every uh, cab is written, is driven by a Muslim. I leave a witness each time, never have an argument, explain the gospel to them. There's a way to do that, but you know what? It's four o'clock. <laughs> I'm gonna pray for you. Yeah, you can go ahead and clap if you want, but I'm gonna pray for you, and then I'm gonna be prayed for, right? Are you coming up to pray for me? Somebody is. Somebody is because God knows I, I need prayer. So pray for us and our ministry. Pray that God will give us guidance, health, and strength. And uh, we just desire to serve. And for all those of you who support our media ministry, Running to Win, thank you so very, very much. We're dependent on you. We are now in Spanish on 100 stations. I was just with Transworld Radio on Monday, and we're thankful for all that. But I want to know, I want you to know, it is all of God. It has so little to do with me. It's like Paul Tripp says, it is all of God. Thank you. Let me pray. Father, I pray today for Colonial. I pray that you might advance its ministries. I pray for all the pastors, their wives, and whoever else is here today. Help us to see that um, we are at a very pivotal time of history. And uh, help us to live wisely, godly, and always remember, as we were told, to be the hands and the feet and the voice and the tone of Jesus to a world that has lost its way. Bless us, we pray, because we are very needy and we need you. In Jesus' name, amen.